probably, you know, this is probably one of those topics where I have, of all the things that I have learned, you know, given everything that I've done, like these lessons, like this lesson in particular of like how to be comfortable being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. has just absolutely transcended, you know, whether it was time in service, in the back of an ambulance, in an emergency room. And, you know, if, if like what I try to impart on people that I either teach in, you know, paramedic Academy or an EMT school, or even now taking over like the fit responder program for the County, like, like this is like central to that. So mm-hmm. it was like, if there was like, you know, if I was to ever like write an autobiography, like this would be like the life lesson that I would, you know, hope to instill in everybody. Yeah. So that's awesome. And Jason and I were talking earlier today too. <clears throat> the cool thing about this is you could take it as, as an instructor, you know, right. because things don't always go well as an EMS educator. Right. You know, absolutely. Sometimes it's 40 students versus you and you had lab planned. <laughs> right. <because laughs> your other instructors called out sick. So it's like, Oh, here's that chaos feeling. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And like, that's like that, ability to if you can if you can take like that chaos and that uncomfortability and make it not that or be at least be more comfortable in that to where you can act and do and it just it just makes everything easier like and 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 the interesting part is that it's not it's not unique to any one particular asset like the way operators are comfortable being uncomfortable is the same way it's the same muscle group if you will that anyone would use a teacher an emt a medic like it's it's all the same skill set it's just how you're applying that skill set and then you know conversely how developed the muscle group is you know um so yeah that's like i said it's so i've i've kind of like people have i've, I've kind of borrowed other people's words i think for it all because i, I think you know guys like that. jocko <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, like, I like, I like guys like Jocko, you know, and, and Tim Kennedy. And, you know, like, I, I think they've, they've spent a fair amount of time, like putting words to a lot of thoughts and feelings that a lot of people have, you know, just given, you know, their popularity. Yeah. Dave Burke um, has a lot of that good stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I wish there was, well, I mean, I, rule number one, if, if this is, if you are in an uncomfortable spot and you want to be more comfortable there, you have to deliberately like rule number one is you have to make yourself uncomfortable repeatedly. Right. So it's like, there's the, there's the uncomfortability that your job will just present to you. Right. So there's like, I mean, that's, that's the chaos that you can't control. Right. So assuming that you can't control that chaos, well, now I'm half, I have to invite a measured amount of chaos into my life in order, like almost like a vaccine to inoculate myself to it. So, you know, and, and for me, like the way I've seen it play out as, you know, a a coach uh, specifically is this idea of stress and like controlled physical stress, whether that be in a gym, whether that be in jujitsu, you know, like, like you invite, like being in, in a fight with someone else is not a natural thing, but nonetheless, when you can control some of the variables, you know, you can distill a lot from that. And then if you, if you hold on to those principles, you take them and you apply them wherever you're at, you know, and, and it works, you know, but the problem is that a lot of people, if given the choice, will not choose uncomfortability. No Mm -hmm. one like, you know, convincing someone that it's worth their time and energy to be uncomfortable, uh, is a hard sell Yeah, because <laughs> we are not like, we are creatures of comfort. You know? Absolutely. And, and you, you refer to it as a muscle. And I love that because I really, where I am in my life right now, um, you know, Jason and I were just talking about this, that muscle can atrophy, you know, if yeah, you absolutely, if, um, you know, I, uh, I had lost a lot of weight. I was very, I would say that I was really close to getting a blue belt and then just life kind of started kicking me and I started finding all these reasons to not go to the gym. And, uh, 
you know, so you, instead of having that tolerance of, yeah, let me roll with this guy that beats me every time. Let me, let me just walk into this head first and not even worry about it. Um, it's uh, my buddy, big John, like tonight, I just, I was tapping just because of pressure. I felt like such a right. sissy, but I was just like, <laughs> but after we stopped, you know, uh, we reset the timer and I was like, all right, you know what? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Right. I've got to rebuild right. my tolerance. <laughs> sure. Well, and that's the thing, like, you know, you like, and that's where it starts, right? So it, it starts with a choice that says, if given the choice between comfort and discomfort, I, at this point in time, am going to choose discomfort, right? So that at least gets you in the door, Psych. right? And, and, and then, and that, exactly, right? But like, <laughs> but that willingness to embrace it, I think like it, it, it shifts your mindset as, you know, as you're, as you're in it, knowing they'd be like, oh man, you know, like I, I chose to be here, you know, and because of that, you, you own it a little differently when you feel like it's your choice. So, you know, I, I think there's, I think there's power in that, in that, you know, you are, you are recognizing that number one, I mean, you're, you're, you're deficient in some area, right? So, so that not only are we addressing the problem, but we're also promoting this idea of self-awareness, you know, where we're not like, we're not going to operate like we're these, these victims of circumstance, you know, in kind of very lofty terms, but, you know, we're going to become advocates for our own development and recognize like, Hey, look, this is, I'm deficient in this area and I'm going to work on it. And therefore I choose to put myself in this situation. It's like, you know, like they have a, they have a, they had a big sign, like in our tent in selection, you know, for SF, it was like, don't forget you chose to be here, right? Like no one required, <laughs> no one, no one like grabbed you and like forced you into this environment. Like you chose to be here and you chose to be here for a reason. Hmm. And, and that why is everything. So I think I heard, I've heard Jason say that so many times, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody well, I mean, is forcing you to do this job. <laughs> right? No, ex exactly. And that's, you know, and, and so, so with that, you know, comes like that, that level of ownership, which is, which is where this whole thing starts. Right. So it's like, you know, this, unfortunately, if you really want to get comfortable being uncomfortable, um, it like, no one is going to force you into that realm, right? Like you have to willingly wade into those waters, you know? And the second part, you know, aside from, you know, after that self-awareness and that choice and that willingness to embrace it, um, comes with a redefining of what we think is of failure, right? And, and because when we when we meet this adversity, right? Like just like you know, you tap in jujitsu. Um, sometimes things are not going to go well, right? You're gonna you're gonna embrace that suck, and you're not going to get the result that you want. And you know, as and I actually, you know, this is I actually am borrowing this from from my parents, who are both educators. Um, you know, that, that we as a, as a culture and society have not taught people how to fail well, right? We have, we have not developed a relationship with failure. And as a result of that, any sort of adversity sometimes just shuts people down, right? Like they, they just can't handle not being successful, you know? And as we've made things easier and more abundant, you know, people have grown up with this idea of expecting success, you know, in fact, we've, we've taught people, we're like, as long as you try as hard as you can, like you're going to be successful, <laughs> not all the time, right? Not all the time. And that's okay. Like, like the outcome is something that, you know, and this is, this is me like stealing a page from the, the yogi's textbook, right? Mm -hmm. Like that outcome control is very Western minded. We're goal focused, we're goal oriented. We only see the end part. The Eastern mindset, it's all processed focused, right? The outcome is inevitable, but if you perfect the process, the outcome will be exactly as it's meant to, right? And, and you, have a, you have an acceptance of that. So, you know, so, so lesson number two is in, you know, in summation, is that you have to redefine your relationship with failure if you are going to be comfortable being uncomfortable. 
And that's a hard one for people to swallow sometimes, especially when you're, especially when you're dealing with adults. And that's pretty you know, huge. Adults. So, so that's what you got from your parents. You were saying that. Yeah. So I, so I've like, never I heard remember, that. Yeah. And well, cause you know, be, like, for example, um, you know, my mom being an, an elementary school teacher, you know, one of the things they actually physically grade students on is grit. Right. Like we never received a, like like so so edu- like Western education structure has started to encompass intangibles um, like grit is something that, you know, teachers will actively look and grade students on, which is which, again, is, is like your your willingness to accept this repeated, you know, discomfort, I guess, for lack of a better word, but over and over and over again. And like you're just you're your unrelenting, you know, desire to continue to improve, right? So it's like when you're evaluating students for their promise, right? We're not just looking at how willing you are when things are going well. We also want to know how willing you are when things are not going well, you know? And and this was further for me, you know, learned during selection when there were some events that were actually designed for you to feel like there was no possible way to succeed we just wanted to see, they wanted to see how well you could fail and how, how, and how much that could shut you down as a person, you know, cause you know, and, and, you know, Jocko has a lot to say about this, but you know, how, how chaotic and how, you know, just unpredictable firefights can be gunfights, battle warfare, right? Like these are not like we try really hard to fight and control them, but these are rapidly developing, you know, tons of variables, you know, way beyond the control of one individual. Well, how do people succeed in such things, you know? So, but that, but that unrelenting desire to continuously meet failure and be candid with it, you know, not, not just, not just accept the fact that you failed, but why you failed and then fix that and then go back at it again. Right. And then, you know, fix the next thing and go back at it again, you know, and that's, you know, I think that was a coach in jujitsu, but he's like, you know, that's, you know, being, being a black belt is just a matter of who's left (laughs) in the end of the day. Right. Like, I mean, you want to, the secret to getting a black belt in jujitsu is just, is who's left at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's not who's the best. It's who's left. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, so that was, and that's been kind of like, that's been one that I've probably struggled with a lot um, because, you know, you, you're, you're kind of torn between this idea that winning is everything, but at the same time, recognizing that, it, you know, winning is not, it's, it's, it, winning is a byproduct of everything else that has gone before it, you know. And I think, and that, and that's something where, you know, I, and I, I guess I blame my yoga practice, but, you know, for, for enforcing a degree of self-awareness and self-awareness training into your life um, has kind of forced you to confront some of those realities and says, Hey, look, here's an honest look at who you are. Here's an honest look at the situation. Don't, you know, only take take responsibility for what's yours Mm. right but don't you know don't play the blame game and be like well if the weather was better you know if this hadn't happened right and we create a lot of excuses surrounding failure like so you know to to really master this art of being comfortable when you're uncomfortable is is ownership yeah and that's kind of you know leads directly into that third at least for me the third part is is controlling what you can control Right. And accepting that, accepting your limitations and being candid about your limitations. And, and this is, man, this is more like, and this, this kind of becomes exceptionally important, I think, in EMS, um, where you as a provider, you know, you're, you're having to look at what you're comfortable doing, what you're not comfortable doing, you know, because I mean, you, you graduate paramedic school having been trained on all the things right but like you know that day one paramedic is not, <laughs> if you get that surgical crike on the side of the airway or you know, side <laughs> of the highway you know like i mean heaven help that person <laughs> it's like right. you know you're not 
you know right. you're not comfortable with it and, it and it's recognizing that right so it's like and that's and it, and that kind of feeds back into the entire loop of being uncomfortable because it's uncomfortable to admit your weaknesses especially in the eyes of peers whom you like want respect from but in the end of the day like if you can't admit weakness mm -hmm. if you can't admit and, and it's not even weakness in the sense that you're a weak person it's it's weakness in the sense that this is an area where i need further improvement and i'm going to seek improvement which also means I'm now going to probably confront failure, which is kind of how this whole, this whole thing becomes, you know, this giant cyclical process yeah. of being, being comfortable with being uncomfortable is that, you know, you have to continuously subject yourself to all of it. Yeah. And the more you can do that, the easier it gets. So I think, Chris, you've, you've kind of hit on it a little bit, but let me just ask you kind of directly as you talk about selection process. And, you know, I think we can, because that's your experience, we can, of course, correlate that not only to the EMS profession, uh, but really anything. Um, you said you intentionally put through um, situations where you can't win. I mean, you're uh -huh. going to be uncomfortable with that. What yep. is the danger of always choosing the comfort? or always choosing the comfortable option. If somebody just says, well, you know, this is easy. I'll just never put myself in an uncomfortable situation. Right. Is there danger to that? Yeah. I mean, I, well, I mean, yes, yes and no, I think. And, and I think it all depends on the person, you know, I, for me personally, you know, I am the type of individual who like, I want to know the limits, right? Like my, I, I had, um, Oh, there's a jujitsu coach back in the day who I interacted with, who I think said it the best in one of his interviews, because he was also a former Greenberry third group guy. Um, he's like, my corpse is going to be disgusting to look at because I'm going to use it. <laughs> right. He's like, I'm, I'm going to use, like, I am not going to be a pretty corpse. And, and what I took from that, when I heard that to kind of bring it back to your point was I want to know where the limits are. Right. So, so the danger of constantly choosing comfort is, you know, is, is not knowing like you're, you're going to be, you're going to be pigeonholed into this zone where it, you have a narrow, a narrow range of performance and a narrow range of comfort. Right. And as long as, as long as you stay within that range, you're good. Right. I mean, as long as, as long as everything remains okay, which I mean, life tells us quite the opposite is true. <laughs> yeah. But as, as long as long as you're in your zone, then you're fine. Right. So that's why I say, yes, it's okay. But what we know to be inevitable is that eventually you're going to get thrown outside that zone. And and some people it, it destroys them, right? I mean, they they have they have an entire breakdown when their comfort zone, their reality becomes shattered. And I think in the medical profession, you know, in our profession where that becomes problematic is we lose people, right? I mean, we lose people because either A, we've, we've created this false expectation in training, or they were not self-aware enough when they walked in the door, or maybe some combination of the two of us, but we, but we end up, we lose people when that comfort zone is constantly challenged. And I, th and I think we saw that with COVID. Right. Mm. I, th I think COVID, COVID placed enough stress on the system to where we saw the comfort zone limitations and, and they were pushed and don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, they were pushed like this, like what I tell people, you know, what I tell paramedic students and, and even people who I work with, I'm like, especially the new hires, I'm like, this is not a comfortable job. All right. So I don't know why you're here, but your why is going to be challenged every single day. And, and we'll see how good your reasoning is, hmm. you know? And so, yes, yeah, so I don't know if that answered your question. But I, mean, I think that the danger to not pursuing discomfort to some degree is it's only as good as your comfort zone allows, right? That's, that's the limitations of your life, you know, and, and you run the risk of, you know, further damage and harm when life just happens. Yeah, no, I think, I think you said that well. And I think probably for me, the point 
even more than, uh, you know, why we got into this profession. If anybody got into this profession just for themselves, then I think they're, uh, hopefully they're not lasting in this profession, but if we're getting into it for others, not just our patients, but, right. uh, coworkers mm. where, um, if you're not going to stretch yourself to become uncomfortable, it may be easier for you. But like you said, you're, you're putting a lot of people in danger. You're sure. putting people's lives in danger, your patients, your, your coworkers. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of damage, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we've done that, that we've done in our EMS programs, I think we've done pretty well, um, are, is a simulation and put, and just throwing students into a, a scenario where they've never seen it before and they just have yeah. to work their way out of it. And a lot of times sure. we'll video them and then we'll watch it. We'll watch it back and you'll watch their heads spin even more, uh, <laughs> as they watch themselves just, yeah. you know, go into a complete tailspin. Um, <laughs> but it's always amazing to me, the, the students that reluctantly step up first mm, and sure. volunteer that first, knowing that they're going to fail, but to Absolutely. see where they grow from that is just tremendous. And that's the kind of thing that I think we would wish for all of us. It's just right. so difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's the rare person that wants to put themselves into that, you know, in, in all the training and everything you went through. I mean, it's ridiculous to think anybody would go that by your own choice, because right. that is such a small, <laughs> not only a small percentage that make it through, but a small percentage that would even subject themselves to that. Right. Well, and yeah, and, and you bring up, you bring up a good point because it's like, you know, this, this whole idea, you know, we, we kind of addressed it through the realm of just the individual, right? This is the individual's pursuit of being uncomfortable, being uncomfortable, but we, you know, we work in team settings. So it's like, the slack gets has to get picked up somewhere if you're all presented with an uncomfortable situation. I mean, if you're if you're working with you know fire another medic crew or with something on a scene, you know, in a, in a rapidly developing situation, you know, it's uncomfortable. Period. Mm -hmm. And now it's now it's up to the measure of individuals present on the scene of how much they've addressed it in their own life because somebody at some point in time has to pick up the slack in order to you know, at least hopefully maybe should ensure the most successful outcome possible, you know, and that, and that's where I think a lot of people, you know, it, it, it kind of, if, if you don't approach this job, right. It, it's not just, it's not just impacting you. It's an impacting everyone else you work with, whether or not you recognize that or not, I don't know, you know, but like, but your performance, especially in medicine in emergency medicine, is not singular, right? I mean, we were talking about patient outcomes. We're talking about your, your partner, if you have one. Um, so, so our actions, you know, on a fundamental level go well beyond ourselves, um, which again, I think for some people, and, and like, you know, it, it always amazes me that, you know, like EMS is, 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 a, is a young profession. And I, and I tell people that because it's like, the like guys, like there's going to be more demanded of you as an 18, 19, 20 you know, 21 year old EMT provider than the average person that's your age. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and if you're not, and if you're not ready to accept that, then you might want to start elsewhere and work your way into this job. Cause I'm like, that's, what's expected of you. Like if you don't see yourself as the person who is willfully and ready to solve chaos that other people will just hurl at you, older people, you know, and I, it's funny. I was, I'll never forget a, a side note to this. I was training somebody and she very self-aware individual, a younger individual. She was like, you know, she's like, you know, I grew up in a culture where we were always looking to our adults and our elders to tell us what to do. Like there is this, like this whole idea of like self-initiation and self-initiated activity was just not something that was culturally present and younger people, like, like there is this look to elders, uh, to give direction. Right. Mm. So it's, so now is like, you know, to be faced with someone who is older than you are, but asking you for guidance and direction, right. It's a complete role reversal. So it was like, I was like, man, I was like, you know, we, and I, and like I said, our, our, our comfortability level of discomfort starts long before, uh, us ever being confronted in this situation. I mean, our entire cultural upbringing from our education to how we were raised 
um, all plays into it, you know, and, and for some it's like, man, you got to undo or not, maybe not undo, but go against, you know, 20, 30 years of, of doing things a particular way. It's complete rewiring. 100%. Complete rewiring, you know, and, and, but the flip side of that though, and, and I pull this from my coaching experience is that, is that once you get them to do that, I mean, if you can, as I can't tell you how many people, you know, a great example in CrossFit is, is handstand pushups, right? Now, like on, on, you know, if I, if I even say the word, the phrase handstand pushups, you're like, there's no way, there's no <laughs> way, there's no way I'd ever flip upside down and do a handstand pushup. And by the way, I did, I, I saw the post of you doing one in front of the ambulance. Yesterday. That was, <laughs> that was pretty funny. He had his legs spread and paralyzed. literally I'm thinking exactly what you just said though. Yes. No, well, I but see, never... but that's my point. It's like, it's like an I, but, but a skilled, I would be like, I would challenge that. And while again, like Eastern Western mindset, Western mindset, they just see the handstand push up. Eastern mindset says, I'm going to break this apart into a process for you. And we're going to, and we're just going to, we're going to go through the process. And as a result, I mean, I saw people who were 50, 60 years old, even get upside down and do a handstand push up. And you're just, they're just like, oh my gosh. Right. Like, and then, and once they have that light bulb moment that like, wait a minute, even though I'm an adult, I can still get better. I can still improve then it becomes addicting. And then it's like, and then, and that's what keeps them coming back. And, and this idea that, you know, you are not a finished product, even in whatever stage of life you're in, like that gives hope. I like you know? that like, you said that. You're not a finished product. That's, you're not. That's right. great. I like that. You're not, you're not a finished product. You know, you're, you know, blue belt's not the last belt. <laughs> <laughs> Jiu -jitsu, right? even though everyone spends like four or five six years as a blue belt yeah you know and, 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 and according to my professor like how many blue belts quit he said right, the that's, majority of the people who quit right. are blue belts they never exactly go back up and that's but it's like you know but by the time you know once you get your purple belt like those are the people who are going to end up becoming black belts and again like i it's just it's the people who are left man mm -hmm. you know and I don't know. So like, that's like, I, I don't know. I have taken, and th those are kind of been like my biggest, I think lessons thus far. Well, and um, I want to kind of like tie into what Jason was talking about too, with simulation and try to have a three tier thing here. So you've been through some of the most rigorous training in any military force in the world. You've also been through paramedic school as a student, and now you are teaching paramedic. So and I know the answer is no, but are we preparing people to be uncomfortable? Like Jason was talking about putting them through simulations that kind of turn the screws a little bit, take some tools away and make them think outside the box and feel that discomfort. Are we doing that globally as a profession enough? Well, I mean, I think you already answered your question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, and, and well, so in all fairness, I think, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. Right. So like I, and, and, and the reason why I say that is, you know, I was actually having this conversation with our medical director when we were looking at like the types of paramedics coming out of school now versus the type of paramedics that, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like, like our profession has evolved very fast. You know, we are, we are a, you know, one of probably, I would say, as far as scope of practice is concerned, you know, we have grown exponentially um, over the past, you know, three decades, especially, I mean, I don't know how it is where you guys are at, but in North Carolina, you know, I mean, North Carolina didn't even start really using medics, late 70s, maybe early 80s, um, and, and going from people who still remember a time when they were like asking the hospital for permission to start IVs or even to give aspirin mm. to now being able to, you know, surgically crike RSI, you know, and, and some of these more advanced procedures that have normally been reserved only for hospital personnel, you know? So I think, at, so, so we've certainly created the demand for such a skill set to be taught 
in training, right? I mean, I, I remember having this conversation with, you know, our director and I was like, you know, it, you know, people are ne- people are always hired because of talent, but they're fired because of personality. You know, like when you look mm. at like what, what ends careers in paramedicine, you know, it's, it's not, it's rarely like a bad enough medical mistake and technical knowledge. It's way more the, you know, kind of like what we call it in, in methodology, like that affective domain type, mm. you know, assessment. So I was like, you know, in some regards, I was like, you know, our paramedic program should, should really be twofold. One, training, but also assessing, right? And, and be able to assess people out and be like, hey, look, man, like, I understand that, you know, you're, you're motivated and you want to become a, a PA or a doctor and, and all that stuff is great. And you're using EMS to kind of get yourself into that pipeline. But but as a result of that, you know, we've also put people into the system who, who really, I don't think need to be here. I mean, they're smart people. They're just not well adapted, maybe well trained enough to kind of handle that singular, you know, lone operator mindset of paramedicine versus hospital medicine. Cause like, even when I work as, when I work in the ER, it's amazing. I love it. Like I wear scrubs, I got tennis shoes on. <laughs> like if I like, you know, I got, I got Jason, my things well, in my. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> one time somebody asked Jason or said to Jason, cause he showed up to a meeting with scrubs and tennis shoes. They were just like, well, yeah, well you need to dress for the job that you want. And Jason was yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly okay, right done. <laughs> you know but it's like but if i need help if i need help in the er i'm just like hey i need help you know i look over my shoulder as opposed to having to call on a radio having to wait right yes. i mean like it's it's a whole it's a very like even though your scope is identical it's a very different application of your skill set which demands a different type of outlook as as you're training it so so you know we so we kind of took a hard look at our education and we started using the same thing. We started filming, you know, our, our program purchased an ambulance. We have an ambulance. So it's like, we'll do scenarios in the back of the ambulance in real time, driving around. I did when I was, I don't know. I, there was one time I, we did a, a little social experiment where I was like, you know, what if we incorporated physical training and mm-hmm. like tactile skills together? So it's like, I want you to do 50 burpees and then intubate, right? Like I want to get your heart rate up. I want to get your, you know, I want you to sweat. I want you to, you know, I want to, I want to like control some of those intangible things. And I want you to improve your eye hand coordination. Because again, like when we train this stuff, we're training it in a, a controlled, a well lit, uh, you know, and, and again, so it's it, for me, like the deficit, and this is, you know, they, they preach this in special forces all day long, you know, the, the deficit comes from training. Like if you can make your training as realistic as you can, like, I mean, to the point where it's like, you are like engaging all five of your senses, you know, the, the sight, the smell, the everything, right? Like, I mean, that's where you're going to get kind of the best bang for your buck when it comes to developing the providers that you want to develop, you know? I mean, obviously I can't make the the patients real, right? But I can make a lot of other stuff feel really real Mm -hmm. um, to the point where your brain believes it. And if your brain believes it, you know, it has a file for it. So when, when you're, when you're confronted with it, you know, your brain accesses that file, which if it's a good file, if it's good training, I mean, who knows? I mean, at least that improves your chances, I think, exponentially to the yeah. people who are, were unrealistically trained um, and who kind of get very, very surprised when things don't go, oh, you mean I just couldn't verbalize? Like, I got IV access. Yeah. Good, you got IV access. Yeah, like, verbalize it. You know, right? Like, <laughs> because it works just that way in real life, you know? Well, and how many, how many of our simulated patients die at the end? Right, exactly. You know, we that, talk about we talk right. about realism, yet in ACLS, everybody gets a pulse back, mm-hmm. which, right. sorry, that's a terrible example. Um, <laughs> anything ACLS. Uh, but uh, no, but we, we put people into situations where they end up ultimately successful. Right. And I think well, that and that's the a thing. false sense of. Absolutely. Everything. Well, and that's, and that's the thing is that, but because, you know, and I, I, um, 
I tell people this, or I try to, I'm like, you know, if you approach this education, like you've approached every other education in the rest of your Western educational career, you're going to do yourself a disservice, right? Like, like the end, the end product is not someone who can just pass the test, right? And, and a lot of people come in, especially the younger people, when they, they come in with that, that mindset that, you know, the end all be all measure of success in my given academic endeavor is a successful grade on an exam. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and they, and they were taught that they've been taught that their entire life, you know, as long as they pass the final, they're good. Right. As long as I pass my national registry, I'm good. And I don't think it's, it's only their fault either. I think the instructors are wired the same way. Yeah, absolutely. We, we fell victim to the same narrative. You know, and, and, and have had, and have been kind of, you know, and, 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 and I'll, so this is kind of, this is more than an aside, but I guess it's worth mentioning here, you know, be cautious of experience, mm. you know, and, and because here's the thing that that comfort zone comment that we made earlier extends into experience where people, sometimes they've been doing it for so long that they've wedged themselves into their own comfort zone because they know how to survive, right? So they're not like, and, and so that's, that's where you want to be cautious of who's the one training new people because, you know, a, a good example is I, I, I always love the brand new paramedic who's already salty. <laughs> like you are salty about your career and you haven't even been in a career. And I, it's like, and I know where you picked that up from, I know where you picked that up from. You picked that up from someone who who's injected that into the education pipeline and 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 they have they have whittled this comfort zone experience down over how many years. But that's not your comfort zone, that's theirs. Mm-hmm. Right? And and so not say, not saying you shouldn't I mean you should absolutely learn from experience, but be cautious of experience in that, you know, it's it's again, it, you know, people who are driving like race car drivers didn't start off as race car drivers, right? They learned how to make things efficient, but they did so via trial and error that they experienced in them alone, right? So don't don't assume that there is no box that you're thinking outside of if you don't know the box yet. Um, so and and like I said, I it's it's a it's a fascinating thing to teach because you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's the whole person concept. It was the same thing that we were selected and assessed for was, was not just your ability to run fast, to lift heavy things. It was everything, right? I mean, nothing, you know, nothing was done in a vacuum to where, you know, nothing else mattered around it. Everything was taken in context. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, and like I said, I think that like this type of approach, this idea of, you know, becoming comfortable truly with being uncomfortable is a daily effort, right? Because I mean, because it's, there's, you know, your, your default as a human, our default as a human will always be to choose comfort. And that's not to say that, you know, we have to choose comfort every single time or discomfort every single time. I mean, I think we have to be selective in how we do it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, at least, and that's kind of where the whole, especially like the whole morphine and mindful, the mindfulness part of it mm-hmm. is to just mindfully choose when we're choosing to be comfortable and when we're choosing to be uncomfortable, but, uh, recognizing yeah, the comfort. Is it, it reminds me of the, uh, have you seen the new, I think it was the new, uh, potato chip commercial or something for hot potato chips and the guy, the kids telling the, the big dad, uh, your, your daughter's a really good kisser. <laughs> <laughs> do you crave the uncomfortable you know so there is there is some uncomfortable that is just stupid that, um, yes that you know is and true, whether right? you call it adrenaline junkies or or people that just push the envelope mm-hmm. um so i think it does obviously has to be custom uh because sure. you know you got some people that are very successful because they were pushed into it because somebody identified something in them and pushed them into something uncomfortable where others are, you know, I'm sure self-starters that are going to push the envelope and make themselves uncomfortable just because that's how they're wired. So, Mm, um, in, 
in general, uh, you know, le leadership or otherwise, you know, put, put yourself in, you know, whatever title you want, whether it's, uh, you know, a title in a department or an organization, but uh, who really should be responsible for uh, kind of pushing people in and out of uh, comfort zones? Ooh, that's a great one. Um, so I think like, and that's, that's where leadership becomes, I think, an art and not a science. I think, you know, as a, as a leader, you have to assess the collective discomfort of all your people, right? I mean, that comes with knowing the people that you're responsible for and assessing potential, right? I mean, because I, I think there's the goal of every leader of every organization, in my opinion, you know, it really should be to maximize the potential of their group, right? So if that's, if that's the end goal, then you know, trying to get to a point where I can custom, I guess, discomfort uh, each individual in my formation, right? And I mean, and it's, and it's it's easier, you know, you know, it's hard for CEOs to do that. I think they can kind of look at it collectively, but you know, EMS is fortunate in the sense that, like, I mean, we're sometimes we're big organizations, but we also get to know people on a very personal level, you know. So I think. You know, and I, this is probably more, I guess, stoic philosophy than anything else, but you, you are kind of who you surround yourself with, you know, so, you know, if you're surrounded, if you, if you create that culture of, you know, pushing people, right, not to the point of breaking, but to the point of developing, then it becomes both a leadership responsibility and hopefully through your leadership responsibility, you foster an individual sense of ownership where that person chooses that path. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to push you to do this. And then hopefully it gets to the point where we push each other to do this. And then I push myself to do this because I don't want to let the group down. So, I mean, hopefully, I mean, and that's, you know, it starts, I think with a, a solid leader, you know, being candid about the strengths and weaknesses of their own organization. And then furthermore, you know, putting people in the right position to inspire and push individuals to become responsible enough mm. to where they can then own the problem. And once, like, once you can get someone to own the problem, that's how you really know, I think it's going to get solved, yeah. you know, cause, cause I think as, as a, you know, as an organization, you know, you can only fix so much, you know, but once you've really got the buy-in of the people that you're with, you know, that's how, you know, great things happen, you know, like, like they're like, even like the leadership guidance in SF was very, very minimal, extremely minimal, right. You know, figure it out, but, but they, but they developed us to a point in which that was enough because they knew how people would own problems of their, on their own accord, you know, and, you know, that was even, that was even the motto, the, the Latin translation of, you know, by their own accord, sua sponte of Ranger Regiment. I mean, that's their mm. motto, you know, by their, by their own accord. Wow. I think like that's, that's kind of the byproduct of successful leadership is, is getting people to own problems and find solutions, you know, because a leader is just one person. I mean, they, there's, they have no greater capability than any other person, but, you know, if they can create, 10 people who own 10 different problems, then they can solve 10 problems. Absolutely. Right? And, and that, and that filters down and down and down, you know, the higher you go. So. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's really one really cool thing. And, and I want to thank people like you and the other members of the special operations community who have come out and made it, you know, there's no field manual for, just civilians for Joe Schmoes who have never been through the training that you have been through that says, Hey, actually the best medicine for your leadership success is to quote unquote, go through the suck, like experience right. it and embrace it. And you're going to come out on the other side, better, stronger, more adaptable. Mm -hmm. And thankfully you guys are sharing that secret. You know, you have David Goggins, who's writing a book right. about it. I can't remember the name of the book, but I read it and I was just like, this guy's crazy, but he's right. <laughs> <laughs> he's insane, yeah. but he's right. <laughs> um, oh. Go ahead. No, yeah, no, like I said, it's, it's funny because it's like, well, one, you like you referred to it as a secret, 
mm-hmm. it's not like that's the thing it's not a secret like everyone right. knows it right like you know like and that's and it's literally it's literally getting people i think to recognize and actually live by the thing that they already know you know like you know like these i i hate to use the word but i mean I really can't think of a better one but like these catchphrases you know embrace the suck mm-hmm. I, you, you've heard that i mean it didn't yeah. you know navy seals take it and they write a book about it and they look you know super cool doing it but but like but but that's a that's a known thing you know you 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 go to a gym right you yeah. work really hard right like that that's a truth that you know you know and and all i'm doing is i'm taking that truth and i'm just applying it globally right mm-hmm. like what if we took that same and that's why like for me like the gym has always been this microcosm of reality where you know you have these this relatively very high degree of control over variables but it but it teaches you so much if you're paying attention you know, like that 200, I think it was Mark twice said, you know, that 225 pound bar is always going to weigh 225 pounds, no matter how, no matter how I feel about it. Mm. If I come into the gym crying, that 225 pound bar is always going to weigh that much. So either I, I have to adapt to that. And once I can do that, once I can do it in that setting, if I'm paying close enough attention, I can do it in any setting, you know, and, you know, like all, all SF, you know, the, the big secret, I think of SF and then this is the, the brethren are going to kill me for, for sharing the, <laughs> sharing the, the forbidden fruit, if you will, is all we did. All we did with that idea is we took that idea and we applied it globally mm-hmm. to our lives. That's it. And if you do that, like David Goggins is no, like they might look like different individuals or crazy individuals. <laughs> They're not. They're not like, I mean, like all they did was they took a concept and they applied it to every facet of their life, not just the gym, not just work, everything, the food they eat when they, right. Exactly. Because it's like, you know, so it's like, you know, we, I mean, we used to have these like endless conversations with people, you know, when I worked for, for softly about how to prepare yourself, you know, for selection and, and the biggest piece of advice that we ended up giving out to people is that you have to fully commit not not and not even like not even like a seven eighths ass or half ass or a quarter like it's it's whole <laughs> it's whole ass right like mm. you have to you have to i like the seven eighths <laughs> there's, but it's like because a lot of people think that they like they're trying to hold like you know it was like it's uh, i mean i'm i know everyone makes fun of me sometimes for my analogies but but for me, like I, I see it all over the place, like in, in, um, was it the, the Batman with Bane in it? You yeah. Know, when they're talking, when they're talking about climbing out of the pit and you have to climb out of the pit the way the child did, and you have to do it without the rope, mm-hmm. you have to get rid of the rope. So that, that thing that, that tie back to whatever comfort you have, you have to deny that if you want to do the impossible. And that's, and that's where people struggle. They'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll commit to this point, right? Or I'll, I'm just, uh, wait, I got to do all this stuff first and then I'll be ready to do it. You can't do it. Like, like that's going to make you unsuccessful. And that's where I think people, when they, they see people like David Goggins or Jocko Wilnick or Tim Kennedy or all these people, right? They're not specially endowed with any magical superpowers, right? As much as, you know, sometimes they look cool doing stuff. All they did was they took that concept and they got rid of the rope. And if, and if you can, if you can get rid of the rope, right, you will be surprised at what you can do, right? I mean, you might, you might, it might not end up being a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or an Army Ranger or whatever. That's an application to it. But at least you will, you will get to the point where, you know, you'll kind of redefine this idea of yeah. your own limitation, right? Yeah. There but if you're a paramedic. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I was like, yeah. And there, there might be some bumps and bruises along the way, but you're going to find yourself at least in a stage where you're growing. Yeah. And, and that's, what's important. Yeah. And I mean, imagine being a paramedic that has a 40, 45 minute transport and it's raining. So the air service isn't coming to help you out. 
and you have a patient that you're putting on pressors that you're having to do all this other stuff and it's just chaos and every line you try to start fails. And I mean, it's just that chaos, but being able to just, just be cool with it. That's, I mean, that is the, that's the goal, right? To be able to operate calmly and have all of your faculties together and just be, just be good. Yeah, but I think that's the point though, is that, is that even the way that we train that is we go down a prescriptive Mm. algorithm. Hey, if the patient's blood pressure is this, do this. If this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. And that's even how we train. I mean, what, what pilot gets in a flight simulator and everything works perfectly and they just take off and land and take off and land because that's all they're going to do. Like, that's so true. No, the entire flight simulator is they throw everything at you that could go Mm -hmm. wrong and you're going to crash the thing sometimes until you figure out how to fix that problem. But you know, I'm just thinking through and I don't do full-time education, but I can only imagine, uh, you know, you get little, uh, you know, li- little, little Johnny and little Timmy at you known 18, 19 years old and you put them through simulations and they fail a few times. You're going to have a parent teacher conference with, you know, mommy and daddy that live upstairs <laughs> or um, a uh, sure. EMS officer conference. Yeah. You know, we're paying for these students to be here. Yeah. Why are they, why right. are they failing? Why are you making them mm. feel bad? But you know, yeah. Chris, you've, you've, you've spoken to it so well about this, the Western culture mm, and right. our, our education is everybody has to survive. And even, you know, some mm. of the books and some of the people you guys are talking about are great, but I, I, I think we probably do a disservice that some of them won't, you know, share probably too much or not too much of their successes. But, uh, you know, I would imagine for as many successes as they've had, they've had failures that oh, could yeah. fill volumes of books. Sure. Um, well, and that, yeah, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, that, that was, shoot, I think I saw it on a, on a Hicks and Gracie poster mm-hmm. one time, but you know, the, the master will have failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. Yeah. You know, that's brilliant. And, and, it, <laughs> and it, it, well, yeah. And it's, it's like, but again, like this, this so, is so Jason, a, we're going to make a Hicks and Gracie, um, I do, I medic <laughs> class citizen shirt. If that's okay. <laughs> well, you know, like you know how like every like all the jujitsu gyms have like the poster of Helio like on the wall. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think you should put I should put one up in every classroom, right? Because it's like that's awesome. Because you know, jujitsu, <laughs> jujitsu, I think has like they have crafted this this entire talk into a martial art, right? Like, like you know, I remember hearing Henner and uh, God, I don't forget who the other person was. I want to say it was Henry Gracie. Well, as as, well, yeah, it was. uh, Yeah, I I distinctly remember Henner talking about it. Mm -hmm. But you know this this whole idea that jujitsu is this entire art of you know you know craftily applying leverage and being uncomfortable in certain situations, right? Like if you can remain calm on the bottom, right? Like so, saying like I, I was the guy who like you know who broke his leg, who all he could do was like play this bottom game till his leg healed up, right? But his bottom game was amazing. Once his leg healed up, man, he was unstoppable because it's like we don't like being on the bottom, you know. But if you can if you can get comfortable being in that situation, mm-hmm. think about all the other things you can become comfortable in, right? It's the same. And that's why I kind of refer to it as a muscle group because it's not a different muscle group. It's the same muscle group. It's just being applied in a different context, you know, and, and yeah, you know, I, I do think we, we do sometimes do a disservice to people if we, if we reinforce this false sense of proficiency, success, and it's not to say that like, you know, we don't, we shouldn't delight in some successes. I think, you know, we have to teach people, like, especially even in the gym, you know, you have to teach people how to delight in other things other than the successful lift, right? So it's like, mm-hmm. maybe you did one thing better this time than you didn't do the last time, which again, we're, we're on the pathway to success, right? You know, you might not have hit the lift, but man, your footwork looked much better this time. And, and, and having instructors who pay closer attention to those small incremental successes is how we kind of like tune people into the process of it all. Because I mean, eventually, you know, and and I can't, if I had a dollar for every, you know, professional CrossFit athlete who has said this at some point in time, but, but I like it, but you have to fall in love with that process, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you fall in love with that process, 
like that's what's going to ensure this continual growth and development, right? So, so I have to break people of this idea that success is singular, pass the exam, I'm good to go. I want to look at success as, man, like you did this good, you did this tiny thing well, this was a little better, you know, like, and I have to, I have to reframe your focus into thinking about it this way. Um, and it's hard. I mean, it is not, it is not an easy thing to do. Um, but I, but I think like, you know, if I, I, again, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but you know, if, if paramedicine continues to evolve in the way that it's trending, you know, that's what, that's, what's demanded of providers. Like if we want to see this, this improvement in pay and scope and all these things that we constantly complain about, well, it's like, you know, we have to meet, we have to be worthy of such things. I'm not saying that we're not now, but I'm saying that, you know, if we think that this is as good as we're ever going to be, then, you know, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice that way. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big thing, you know, and because it, it gets it, it really gets at everything you've ever done and continue to do. And you realize that, you know, it's, it's how you approach one thing is how you approach everything, that's you know, very true. and, and that's where I think people sometimes struggle because if, you know, you kind of look at like, look at, look at how David Goggins and, and Jocko and all those people, like, look how they live their daily lives. Yeah. Four o'clock in the morning, every morning, <laughs> there's a watch. Right. On Instagram, right. he posts a, a watch at four o'clock saying, I'm up working out. I would much rather be in bed, but I'm up working out. Right. You know, and, and here's the thing. Four o'clock in the morning is available pretty much to everyone, assuming you're not doing something else. Yeah. This but, guy right here, you know, Jason, I, I call him the sleepless elite. He's just like Jocko. Like Jocko can go to bed at 12 and then get up at four. <laughs> And then go and do muscle ups for an hour. Jason's the same way. He goes to bed at twelve and then gets up super early. Yeah, hey man, let's let, let's crank out. Let, let's crank this project out. People make fun of me because I, I so I the I'll I'll be I'll be open with you and the listeners, and you can make fun of me for all you want. <laughs> I still lay out my clothes every night, like my uniform, and my stuff. And I'm on the ambulance tomorrow. It's laid out right now. That's one like, less decision to make like, in the morning. It, it, and see, and that's, so, you know, it's funny because you made, you know, you made the comment about like, how do we get people like, you know, use the, the analogy of the flight simulator, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in the chaos, eliminate, and, and this is, you know, I think Jocko phrased this pretty well, you know, eliminate the amount of decisions that you have to make. Yeah. Right. So like, if I can, for example, like how many people, when you're ready to intubate, you have, you know, a different sized ET tube out you've got your King airway out, you've got your NPA out, you've got your bag out, you've got like, you've got four or five things already laid out on the table before you try to do the one thing. Or do you just try to do the one thing, hoping and praying that that one thing is going to work. Right? And then because, start ripping through the bag looking. Right. And then it. start, and then start, and then everything starts coming out <laughs> and, you know, things fly everywhere and, you know, people start cursing and all that stuff. But it was like, but that wasn't, that pathway through that moment of discomfort didn't have anything to do with your training. It had everything to do with your planning. Mm. Right. So it's so like, if you, if you, if you fail to plan and account for variable change as in not working out being the variable, right. Then, then, then that's a planning error that you just have to readjust your planning for. Right. So it's like, if you remove the amount of decisions that have to be made in a chaotic moment by pre-planning, pre-staging, pre-mixing, pre-drawing up, pre all of that stuff, right? Do all of that stuff up front when it's not chaos, then when the moment of chaos, which is inevitable, comes, you're that much more prepared for it. So you know, that's, in, that's interesting you say that because that's actually... Uh, I don't know if you there. There's actually a book by the guy, by a guy by the name of uh, Charles Dewey called um, Keystone Habits, and that's actually one of the things that he actually talks about is laying out your clothes um, and taking that decision away. You know, some of the most famous right. people that have done that. Uh, Barack Obama wears two color suits, so he doesn't have to really think about what he's going to wear. Hmm. Um, Steve Jobs, um, uh, Zuckerberg, 
Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Cuban, some of these people, they dress the way they do because that's one less decision that they have to make. Right. Exactly. And, and right. when that becomes the first decision of the day, things start to kind of flow from there. Mm. Right. Absolutely. And that like, I, I, I wholeheartedly think that like that, that is just as applicable for, you know, your, your fortune 500 CEOs as it is to your street paramedic of saying that, Hey, look, you know, if you want to make the moment feel less chaotic, do most of your planning beforehand, right? A lot of people like, you know, I think I used the example of, you know, the, the airborne jump on, on the last podcast where it's like, you know, everyone sees the airborne jump, but what they don't see is the five, six hours of rehearsing that went in before that. Cause I mean, it's not sexy, right? It's not, nobody likes to see a bunch of dudes in a parachute, you know, being in a formation and just, you know, pretending to free fall the airplane, but, but they do that because, you know, in that moment where variables are uncontrollable, right, at least there's a plan, right, and you've got multiple levels of planning, you know, and if you can remove decisions from that and make those, you know, you make your decision making process binary, left or right, right, we already know which, like, which decisions or which options are on the table, now that makes things easier on us, you know, so sometimes, you know, getting better at discomfort really is not, it's not even really even developing a skill. It's developing a plan. Right. And so, and that's on the person, right. And, and it takes time. It, you know, you have like, if you're laying out your clothes, you're going to bed early, you can start to see how all of your life starts to work around this entire endeavor. Right. And then before you know it, you're eating differently, you're sleeping differently right? And, but things start to work for you because you've, you've adjusted this whole person concept because again, chaos demands the whole person, right? And, and, you know, the people who are, are, are giving themselves up to it, right? Those are the people who, you know, we kind of look to, to lead us in those chaotic moments because it, they've made that choice, right? They've aligned the variables of their life in a certain way that allow that kind of that seamless flow uh, through that chaotic moment. Awesome. So, and and yeah. like you said earlier, they've controlled the things that they can control. So right. whenever the things that show up that they can't control, it's not that big of a deal. Exactly. Right. At least, at least then, you know, you've done everything you can do. And I mean, and that's like, shoot, if there's, if there's one thing that I think plagues high performing people, more than anything else is wondering if there was something more you could have done. Mm. Right. Like, and, and that's, but again, but, but the remedy to that is being comfortable with the amount of effort you put into any given moment. Right. So if, if you're someone who is struggling with some of the hardships associated with this job, right. You know, bust ass preparing and that, that will help alleviate some of that burden that you feel, because at least, you know, you did everything you knew how to do planned for, could have possibly thought about, right. And, and, and I think, and I, and, and your patients are owed that, I think, you know, mm. because then, then it's, it's much, much easier. I won't say it's not guaranteed, but it's much, much easier to continue to move forward you know, knowing that you put in everything you could into any given moment. Yeah, you know, let me ask one more question. Um, I think maybe as we as we wrap it up, and maybe this is even just a segue to a, a whole other talk. Um, but you know, what I'm hearing a lot, and kind of some light bulbs have kind of gone off for me um, during this conversation, and maybe this is just for me personally that uncomfortable situations for me are often uh, situations where I don't want to fail. Mm -hmm. And if I think I'm going to fail, I'm not going to push myself to do it. So how do we, how, or, or how do leaders or how do we create a culture where failure is not only acceptable, it's almost necessary. Ooh. And maybe that's not a question for tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty well, awesome. Maybe that's a whole that's a nother question. But so, uh, 
it's funny you say, and I, and I, I would have to dig into my, my podcast history, whether this was on either a Ted talk or a podcast or something, but I, I want to say it was Google or one of the Silicon Valley companies who actually created a department whose sole responsibility it was, was to create things just to fail. It's Google. Yes. I, wow. I, well, I, I, I vaguely, I vaguely remember hearing about it. And, and when I thought about it, I was like, man, that's brilliant. You know, and I, I think first and foremost, you know, one is we have to separate the punitive action from the failed outcome versus the failed effort. Like, I, I think a lot, again, yeah. if we're, if we're, if we're looking at this from getting people comfortable with failing, right. Cause a lot of people, they just, they don't want to get in trouble. I get that. Right. No one wants to be sent to the principal's office, but 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 the, there's a there's a vast difference between a failed effort and a failed outcome. The outcome which you don't have any control over, the effort you, in large part, do. So, you know, and and this is again like this is <laughs> talking about reforming, especially from an education standpoint, reforming the entire Western canon of yeah. of educational doctrine Good by, by saying by saying <laughs> this right but but i think but i think if we really wanted to get there as a profession and as an educational effort we'd have to evaluate people differently than exams and tests which focus on outcome or at least revise it to grade based on effort right and 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 pursuit and 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 I and and maybe there's a way to kind of marry the two of them up, you know, because obviously if we got someone who tries, like I could try really hard to be an Olympic gymnast, it's not going to happen for for a lot of reasons. But right, but 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 that so there's I there's a there's a an artful way to do it, which is which is beyond me. But I think that's kind of the starting point is to look at the difference between outcome and effort, and then evaluate differently right which which gets because what we want to do is we want to get people to really put in the work and the time into developing the skill and practice and then apply it and then and then adjust from there but even that willful adjustment takes continued effort so we want people ideally speaking to get comfortable with failure to the point where they've kind of they're not focused so much on the outcome as they are how much they're putting into at least doing what they can to ensure a successful outcome. So. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I think that brings us back to almost your first point that I think was kind of a light bulb moment for me is that you're never done. It doesn't right. matter how old you are, or wherever you are in your career. We often think of this, we've, we've, Brian and I have spoken about this a lot, is that we think initial education is it. Right. Um, and we don't think that this is a lifelong, uh, not only learning tool, but you know, personal, personal development. So just like you're talking about. So I, um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, dude, this has been great. This has been fantastic. And, uh, like Jason was saying, I think that this is kind of spawning off several ideas of things that we could talk yeah. about for hours. So absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. Like I said, cause there's, there's so like, yeah, no, this is, this is the, like, this is one of those life pursuits things where, you know, it yeah. filters into just about everything. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, man. so, so take a second and, uh, tell the folks listening or watching on YouTube, how they can uh, check out morphine and mindfulness and know a little yeah, bit more so, about what you're doing. Yeah. So again, um, as far as the, the social medias are concerned, um, you can check out morphine and mindfulness, just at morphine and mindfulness. If you're on Instagram, I actually just redid the shop on the website. Nice. Um, everything is free now. So every, like, so the stress management guide, I put in a, uh, a daily journal page where, cause again, self-awareness is kind of the, where all of this starts is you have to be aware of the deficiencies. Um, everything is free. So just, if you want to go on there, you can download it. Um, and yeah, you can just reach out either the morphine and mindfulness, Instagram, voodoo medic, Spelled like that Haitian Creole V O D O U medic. <laughs> so well, we can probably link, link. We can link to that from our. Oh site. yeah, 
Yeah. 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 You care, like you said, care if we put your, uh, no. your Instagram on there? Ab- absolutely. Feels, please feel free to do that. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, like I said, this is, this is a passion and I'm happy to help. And I just, like I said, I, I think the information I was talking to my, my sister about it and, uh, you know, I, she, I made the point. I was like, you know, of all the yoga classes that I've ever taught donation yoga is where you actually make the most, mm. you know, is when you make, when you ask people, well, you don't require, you just, you know, you make it available for people to donate. Like you put the little poor person hat, like in front of your mat, you know, people just, <laughs> they, they, to, they, to, they toss their, they toss their change in on the way out. You know? yeah, yeah. You actually make more that way than you do in it. No, I just, I, I think that what we were talking about, you know, with, with everything that I put together, I mean, the information should be free and available for everyone. So it's on the website um, for you to download. So have at it. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'd be happy to, happy to chat you up. Right on, brother. Well, we'll, we'll see you next time then. Yeah, man. You guys, I, like I said, it's always a good time. I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce.